Welcome to Compare to Who, the podcast to help you stop comparing and start living. I'm your host, Heather Creekmore. I hate to admit this, but I used to secretly obsess over my appearance. I thought it was part of my job as a woman to always look better, but never felt like I could be good enough. Maybe you can relate. But God, in His grace, He showed me a way out, and I want to give you all the tools you need to break free, too. If you've ever spent too much time stressing over your looks, I get it. I hope you'll keep listening and find the same freedom I have. Here are three other things you need to know about me. I'm a minivan driving mom of four elementary age kids. I'm author of the book Compared to Who and a blogger at comparedtowho.me. And you just may have seen my epic bake fail on Netflix. If you've ever struggled with comparison or body image issues, Compared to Who is the show for you. I hope you enjoy today's episode and tell a friend about it. Hello and welcome to Compare to the Podcast. I'm Heather Creekmore and I am so glad that you're listening today. Today is an experiment for me. Today is my first time to have a guest on the Compared to Who show. And I know that you're going to love and be blessed by today's conversation. So my guest today is wife of a retired military man. She's a mom and a stepmom. She was an English teacher for 17 years. She's the daughter of a Christian counselor. And a woman who, through her blog, encourages moms to remember that the ultimate goal of parenting is to raise a child who loves Jesus, not one who's successful. Her blog is called Heaven Not Harvard, and it encourages thousands of women around the world to do just that. I'm delighted to have her with me today. Jen DeFratis, thanks for being on Compared to Who. Hi, Heather. I'm so glad to be here today. I'm glad to have you. So, Jen, you and I met, what, a couple years ago when I was publishing Compared to Who. Yes. You were part of my launch team, and I really appreciated uh, all of your work there. But I found over the years that we've gotten to know each other that we have a lot in common. I was an Army brat, and you were an Army wife for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit more about your backstory? Tell us a little bit more about you. Well, I graduated from college, Northern Illinois University, and got my first teaching job in Central Illinois. And because I moved there, I met my husband, who was already a soldier. So I didn't join the beginning of his career, but was there for the last 14 years. We moved to Fort Campbell was our first move. Now, he'd been stationed there before we were married. And then we moved to Fort Hood, then Fort Benning, and we kept waiting to move, and the Army didn't send us anywhere. So we thought, well, God must have a plan, and we just stayed put. And we are here for the foreseeable future. Now that he's retired, he got a job in the area after he retired that he loves. And I've enjoyed being a military wife. Um, It definitely was not an experience that I was looking for. The first thought when I met my husband was I'm not dating a soldier because it was so complicated and so foreign. But I'm really glad that I was willing to go on the adventure. Um, Some of the military women that I've met have just been some of the most edifying and uplifting. You know, you always hear all the stories about military wives that are negative. And I think people are just looking in the wrong places. I really love our PWOC, which is Mm -hmm. Protestant Women of the Chapel. And those women at Fort Benning PWOC especially, but they come from all over. So there's, I literally have friends in PWOCs all over the, the world. And they're just women searching after God's heart. And they're such a beautiful part of my life. Yes. I, you know, I talked a couple episodes ago about my experience. So I was an army kid, army brat, I guess, <laughs> but <laughs> I was, you know, I was raised moving around a lot and then married a Marine. I wanted, I was a little different than you. I was like, I want the military life, but my husband only stayed in for a couple of years after we got married, but I found the exact same thing. I wasn't sure moving, you know, away. We got married and moved to California to live there. And I wasn't sure if I was going to have any friends at all. And I found such a strong community with those military wives. And it was so fun because we all had a lot in common. You know, it's like when you go through common trials together, it kind of bonds you closer. And so I I had a great experience as a military wife too. Well, tell me about what you do now. So I know you're a homeschooling mom and we have that in common as well Mm -hmm. because I homeschool our four kids and you homeschool your daughter who's nine. But what else do you do? Tell us about Heaven Not Harvard and what your, your mission is there. Well, Heaven Not Harvard kind of came about from a conversation with my, one of my best friends, one of these military wives that has come into my life. And both of our children just didn't turn out to be the people we kind of imagined our children would be. These little mm-hmm. perfect, obedient people that would just 
fulfill us and be full of joy and light always. Sometimes we're disobedient and sometimes we're difficult or didn't sleep through the night and had health issues, uh, special needs. And we just kind of were really talking about, we had to readjust our expectation for what success was. Mm -hmm. Is it really all that important if my kid goes to Harvard, if they don't love Jesus? Mm -hmm. Is it okay if my kid has a very average job? but is the most beautiful Christian in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, that really was like my heart. And it started with watching my daughter and seeing how she responded to me, seeing how a perfect loving God has children who reject him and are disobedient and yet loves us because I can see myself loving my daughter despite her disobedience, despite her rebellion and being the the dad and the prodigal son, you know, just come home, kill the fatted calf. We're having a party whenever she would come back to me after a moment of rebellion. And it's like that moment kind of opened my eyes to how God wants a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. So it started as parenting. And then I started to see how that also relates to our marriages. And it Mm -hmm. relates to who I am as a, a wife and a daughter, a sister, a friend, and just overall in my life. What is my mission? Am I focused on heaven or Harvard? the idea of the earthly success. Sure. That's really good. And I love that picture of looking at our kids. I mean, like you said, as moms, we know that no matter how they respond to us, we're still going to love them. But remembering that our heavenly father sees us that way too. That's, that's good stuff. I I love what you do through your blog. Well, the purpose of this podcast is to talk about issues like comparison and body image, all that Mm -hmm. stuff that you and I have kind of had this conversation before that no one really likes to talk about this stuff, right? I mean, this is not, you don't want to air your junk in these areas, right? but you have been willing and brave, shall I say, to share a little bit about your story with body image and and comparison in there too uh, on your blog. And I'm wondering if you would share that for the listeners today. Just tell us a little bit about how you've struggled in these areas. Body image been bogging you down for too long. It's time to get free, my friend. Go to comparejahoo.me. Take your free body image awareness quiz. You will learn amazing things. You'll get your results right away. And I think you'll have fun too, because I mean, who doesn't love to take quizzes? Go to comparejahoo.me. There's lots of great resources on that site articles about body image and comparison, and how you can find freedom through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Check it out today. Right after this episode, of course. Okay, so I want to start off by talking about how I found your book. Okay, yeah, I'd love to hear that. I don't think we've ever talked about that. Because, you know, you put out the invite to join the launch team in a few places, and I kept seeing it, and I was not interested. Uh I was like, I am not reading one more book that's going to make me feel bad about how I look. Or make me think if I just try a little harder, I'll be prettier or skinnier or whatever. And I just kept going, I'm not going to do that to myself. I'm not going to do that to myself. And it kept coming up in my news feed. I'm getting emails. It was like it was (laughs) everywhere. And I thought, all right, God, I will read this book. And I, every page, it was like, you were writing my heart. I, I mean, I even underlined places where we had things in common. And even something as simple as being on the speech team in high Uh school. Fun. So um, the book was really kind of though the ending of my journey. Okay. And I don't, I don't mean that I'm successfully comp- beaten all my body image issues, but God had me on this kind of path. If I go all the way back to the first time I realized I had body image issues, it was probably the first day of school. Mm-hmm. Because until you go to school and are really around other kids, you don't have a frame of reference. Mm-hmm to what is normal or beautiful outside of what your mom and dad tell you. I mean, I grew up in the 70s, so TV was pretty limited. You knew the five kids on your block, Mm -hmm. and that was all there was. So the first day of school, when kids started saying things like, why are your teeth so big? Mm -hmm. Why is your face so long? Mm -hmm. You're not very pretty. And they started calling me nicknames. Mm -hmm. And I spent all of elementary school just kind of being the target 
of lots mm-hmm. of bullying, really cruel teasing, middle school as well. So I grew up with this picture in my head that I was ugly, mm-hmm. that being pretty was the goal so that I could make that stop, not realizing that kids were teasing other kids about everything. You know, mm-hmm. you don't see that when you're a kid. It was just a really formative concept that I was not enough. I needed to do something to be enough and that I never quite got there. And then I started having weight issues. Now, some of it was in my head. I mean, let's be honest. If I look back at my 17-year-old self, I did not have weight issues. Uh (laughs) (laughs) But you compare yourself to the other kids. You compare yourself to the girl that could eat a thousand hamburgers and never gain a pound. And hence, compared to who? Mm -hmm. There's the girl that could eat nothing and gain six pounds. So you sit there and put yourself in that line of where do I fall? Who am I better than? Who am I less than? But it's all based on this. I'm supposed to be thin and pretty. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? And it started this cycle of having really a negative relationship with food. And I know you've struggled with that as well, where food is on one hand comfort, something we enjoy. And on the other hand, we hate it because it we fight with what it does to our bodies. And I just spent years kind of in that cycle of exercising too much, eating too little, eating too much and not exercising enough. <laughs> but no matter where I was, never feeling like I was done. Like I couldn't be comfortable in my own body. And nothing was ever good enough. I even got down to a point where I was at my thinnest as an adult wearing a size two, four. And it was still all I could do to look in the mirror and not see the five more pounds Mm -hmm. or the places where I had stretch marks from where I'd been heavy. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't escape it. Mm -hmm. It was so much everything that I thought about. Mm -hmm. I started long distance running at one point. And some of it was to lose weight. But some of it was my husband was deployed and it was a really empowering thing to say, I'm going to train and run a half marathon while you're gone and then learn how to run well. And I love doing that, but I see that it was also a lot about the body image. And I just couldn't get to a point of saying, I have a healthy understanding of taking care of my body and who I am. And when I moved to Fort Benning, I knew I had some hip problems, long distance running. And I, I started running and went from no miles to a half marathon in four months. Wow. So I did not give my body enough time to be build in the bone density that you need to really do that well. And I caused damage to my hips. And mm-hmm. some of it was I was born with a birth defect that has a lot of comorbidity, you know, where you have other issues that are kind of part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was born with no skin on my stomach and no mm-hmm. abdominal muscles. Mm-hmm. So I've had to have surgeries over the years and had health issues, but the hips became... Over the last six years, I've had three surgeries. I've dislocated my hip three times. I'm probably about to have another surgery. So keeping weight off was just not happening. Mm -hmm. I'm literally stuck sitting on the couch in a brace right now. Can't do anything about it. So how do I adjust being okay with who I am when I start gaining so Mm -hmm. much weight? And Jen, I think that that is something that so many women listening to this program are asking themselves the same question. Like, okay, I am not where I want to be physically. So how, how can I make peace with my body image? How can I make peace with my body? So tell us how has God worked in your heart and in your life on this issue? Like what has he done to help you kind of figure out how to make that peace? The first thing I really saw God doing was I read a book called A Confident Heart by Renee Mm -hmm. Swope. Uh And I don't remember much about the book, but she had a chart at the end that was our identity in Christ. And it was verse after verse after verse after verse. And something about that chart, even all these years later, I just remember saying, oh, this is who I am. Mm. None of that other stuff really matters. Mm. But it wasn't an instant switch like, okay, I'm done worrying about my body. But it was definitely like we talked about being a mom. You know, I waited a long time to be a mom and I wanted it to be the end all be all. I thought being a mom was going to be it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't either. (laughs) You know, being married wasn't it. There was Mm -hmm. always an emptiness that God was supposed to be filling. And I had to turn that over to him and let him start changing who I was. Awesome. I love that. Yep. I mean, you know my story. I share it in the book. But 
I thought the same. I thought marriage was going to fix it. I thought having a baby was going to fix it. I mean, I felt like I tried everything and I was a little angry with God that those things didn't work. <laughs> you know, I was like, God, you were supposed to work it out my way, <laughs> but you didn't. You let me down here. Well, what else should our listeners know about you? How would you encourage the women listening to this show if they want to break free from comparison and body image? What would you encourage them to do? First of all, read your book. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that shameless plug. I appreciate I that. I mean, I didn't plug your book because I was on your launch team. Mm -hmm. I plugged your book because something inside of me was ready to hear what you had to say. And the way you said it was like the light bulb moment. Mm -hmm. If any of your listeners haven't taken the time to read it and are struggling with body image, I really think it's crucial because I needed to hear that all my comparison and envy and vanity and pride was sin. I needed to hear that it was idolatry because I always thought, well, I don't have any idols. I don't have anything I worship. Oh, yes, I did. And I needed to let that go. And I needed to recognize that that was a ridiculous goal. You know, one of your statistics in the book was 91% of people struggle with body image. And I'm pretty sure the other 9% must be nuns because uh -huh. I don't know <laughs> any <lying>. women. Right? <laughs> I don't know any women who don't struggle with body image. So that was really empowering for me to realize there isn't a finish line. No matter how skinny you get, the next thing is going to be the wrinkles or the age spots. Mm -hmm. You can't get there. And if you mm -hmm. keep trying, you end up empty and bitter and sad because you're not filling that emptiness inside you with Jesus. And that's what we need to do. Oh, that's awesome. That's, I like to say thin is not a destination. No. You know, we, we think it is. I mean, especially when you struggle with the weight and body image and it's all that struggle in your head. Like you said, I mean, sometimes it's not actually a struggle in your body. It's just the struggle in your head. But if you think if I could just get to thin, if I could just get to that size, but my experience very much like yours, I mean, it wore the small size and it was not enough. And every time I speak somewhere, I have woman after woman come up to me and say, yep, same here. I had the same experience. I wore mm -hmm. the size. I spent the time in the gym and it's still, it didn't change how I felt on the inside. So true yep. words, Jen. And true words. Well, you told us a little bit about what you do at Heaven, not Harvard, and your mission there. What is your dream for Christian women? Your passion behind Heaven, not Harvard is to encourage them to not look for success, but to make sure they're raising kids who love Jesus. But, but what's, what's your dream for Christian women? I really want, you know, in the context of Compared to Who and this conversation, because there's so many things I want for Christian women, uh -huh. <laughs> but I really want them to understand God created you exactly as you are with all the beauty, with all the flaws, mm -hmm. with the gifts and the things you're terrible at. <laughs> he did that on purpose because only you fit in his plan in that place where he has put you. The things that you're good at are because you need those skills to do the things that he has set before you. you know, Ephesians talks about before the foundation of the world that he has set good works for us to do and has planned us. We have to do what God has set before us. I am a terrible singer. I mean, even people who love me will just say, no, don't. <laughs> don't sing. And my heart used to break over that. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the funniest things about your book was that it helped me stop comparing those things too. Mm -hmm. And recognize that I can celebrate that one of my friends is an amazing singer without feeling jealous because that's not the gift that God gave me. That's not the purpose that he has for me. And the fact that I'm a, a terrible singer means I've poured myself into something else that he needed me to do, mm -hmm. like my writing. You know, I don't know what God's plan is for my blog or my speaking. I've done some speaking. I went to uh, Fort Rucker and spoke to the PWOC there about being a radical wife. Hmm. I've got a few books kind of floating in the brain, but they're not quite on paper yet. I've actually started a new website that is just baby blog. I've got one post, but it's called The Mom Apologist. Okay, The Mom Apologist. Okay. But it's all one word. Okay. The Mom Apologist is all one word. Okay. And it's going to be a blog where I take some of the ideas of Christianity and say, why is this true? So not just how do we live it out, but how do we know this is mm -hmm. true and teach our children a worldview that is accurate and really reflects how God created us and how God created the world. So I really want women to know Jesus and that we can trust that Jesus was real. Jesus really died for us. God really created the world. And we can trust in that and base our entire lives and how we do everything 
around that truth. That's a good word, Jen. That's a great word. I will put links to your new baby blog, The Mom Apologist, and Heaven Not Harvard in the show notes for this. So I'm going to just encourage everyone listening today to go check out Jen's writing. She's got some good stuff on there, especially if you're a military wife. I noticed she got a lot of good pieces of advice for military wives and homeschooling moms like us. So go check out her blogs and um, and connect with her. Anything else you want to say as we, we wrap it up today, Jen? I just hope that women who are listening to you are able to hear how freeing it is to mm-hmm. let go of comparison. Mm-hmm. One of your recent podcasts really struck me as needing a little heart check, a little conviction that I need to stop comparing myself to the best version of me I could imagine. Mm. Because I, I realize I can't be that person mm. because the best version of me would do all the things. Mm-hmm. And I don't have time to do all the things. And I certainly <laughs> don't have the physical capability right now. Mm-hmm. And every time I try to do all the things, I end up again burnt out. There's so much more to learning not to compare than just feeling good about the way you look. It's being able to celebrate other people. It's being able to mm-hmm. celebrate your strength. It's being able to let go of worrying about things that you're not good at. It, it's not worrying about if your house is clean enough, when your friends come over. There's so much freedom in just saying, I am who I am today. And I'm doing the best to honor Christ in that. And the dust on my shelf <laughs> might not be pretty, but God's not concerned about that. And I can let some truth wash over me as who I am as a whole person, that God loves me and he honors who I am because he put me right here today Mm -hmm. to be this steward of this body, Mm -hmm. of this ministry, especially as moms, Mm -hmm. because we're the first line of defense for our children. You know, we create their worldview in a lot of ways because we give them the tools to see things. And if we're not seeing the world clearly and correctly ourselves, if we're struggling with things, and of course we always struggle, but if we don't let God just wash over us and work in our hearts and turn the spaces in our brains that kind of need to get more focused on him, we're missing an opportunity to point our children toward him. Amen. That's good. And my next book is actually all about that ideal self and chasing the burden of better. So Mm. it should be out sometime next summer. It doesn't really have a title pinned down yet so that's why i haven't announced that but uh but it's about all that stuff too so well Jen let Dupreni's, me know if you oh, need me to be on your launch team. oh hey yeah, I'm, you're signed up i'm not even asking i'm just i'm you're, you're the first one on the list <laughs> so, all right Jen DeFreitas, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today and for the wisdom you shared it's been great chatting with you that's all for today's episode i hope you will stay tuned and listen to the next one bye bye <laughs>